Hello, welcome to Cross Currents, produced by the City of Fort Collins in cooperation with the Larimer County League of Women Voters. I'm Barbara Rutstein, the moderator for today's program. The views expressed on this program are solely those of the participants and don't necessarily reflect the views of Fort Collins TV, the City of Fort Collins, or the Larimer County League of Women Voters. Our topic is affordable housing. Why is it so complicated? After reading a few articles on this topic, I discovered that this is not an issue exclusive to Colorado or Fort Collins. It appears that people and governments are discussing housing problems in places as diverse as Singapore, Nairobi, Kenya, Australia, Saudi Arabia, as well as all over the US. No doubt each loca location has unique problems, and the solutions, if there are any, will also be unique to each location and its particular culture and society. More locally, many concerned organizations, government entities, developers, and realty companies are meeting to try to find acceptable solutions to our immediate problems. The Denver Post has had recent articles on how Denver and Boulder are trying to address their similar issues. For our discussion, we plan to talk about some of the terms used regarding affordable housing, the future that makes housing unaffordable, or the factors that make housing unaffordable, and various viewpoints on how to improve the local housing dilemma. Our participants are, on my right, Kelly Evans from Neighbor to Neighbor. On her uh, right is Kristen Stevens, Fort Collins City Council Member from District 4. And on her right is Will Flowers, the 2019 Chairman of the Fort Collins Board of Realtors. Welcome to you and to our studio audience and to our viewing audience. First, let's talk about definitions. Some people talk about affordable housing and others use the term housing affordability. Is there a difference? Will, what do real realtors use? Uh, well, we use both terms, but there is a, a big difference. Um, housing affordability is um, a broader range. It encompasses all elements of housing from the cost of building houses, materials, labor, land, impact fees, water, all of that, transportation, jobs, housing affordability includes every element of your life and your housing. Um, affordable housing relates more to subsidized housing. So it's, it's housing that is provided by, um, or subsidies that are provided by uh, intermediaries, somebody that's a, a municipality or a nonprofit organization. Okay. Do the rest of you use the terms the same way? Um, we... In, in general, we use the term affordable housing, and um, for, for the city's purposes, that means uh, dwelling units available for rent or purchase that would be affordable to housing, uh, to households that uh, earn 80% or less of the area median income. So uh, primarily, we're concerned with that. I mean, we are concerned with housing and affordability in general. Um, I think we have less to maybe do about that. I mean, some of that is market driven, so. Okay, and what about uh, Kelly? I think for, for organizations in general, we steer clear these days from the term affordable housing. Uh, Will is correct that it generally relates to subsidized housing. Uh, it's important to neighbor to neighbor and other organizations specializing in housing to break down some of those language um, labels. So I always only speak to it in terms of housing affordability, um, primarily because my organization does serve all income levels and it's important to us across income levels. Okay, that's good to know because I think some of us had some other um, interpretations of that, so it's good to know that. Uh, Kristen, does the city have any policies that make any distinctions or special definitions for affordability? We could look at a slide. I think maybe it's, well, it's not there. Slide number three. There, maybe Kristen can explain that to us. 
Yeah, sure, sorry. Um, so I did talk about the first bullet point there that says dwelling units um, for rent or purchase for, that would be affordable for households earning 80% or less of the area median income. And we do have a chart that shows what the area median income is. But um, so for a family of four, I believe it's uh, 68000 roughly $68,000 a year for, is 80%. A lot of the housing that um, that does get subsidized or or that we're looking at is as low as the thirty percent or under. Uh -huh. So for our land bank purposes, initially we had we were we were trying to build housing that doesn't that the market doesn't reach. So that is often people who are making thirty percent or less than the area median income. Okay, and you also mentioned land bank. Tell us what that is. Sure. So about ten or fifteen years ago, the city of Fort Collins purchased land. Uh, that was not developed uh, in order to hold on to it. And as, as development occurred around this land, then the, it was thought that the land could be used, sold to, to somebody who would develop it for affordable housing purposes, and uh, that, that at that point the land would be, would be available to use for affordable and would only be sold to people who would be developing affordable housing. So we do have one land bank property right now that's, uh, that we've activated, and that's a land bank property that's on Horsetooth. And so there are, I believe, 100 units or so, roughly 100 units that are going in around Horsetooth and between Shields and Taft Hill. Okay, I think I've seen those. Right. Yes, so, yes. And there are other land bank properties that we haven't been able to activate for whatever reason yet. Um, but, you know, we, we do have those land bank properties available when, when, when somebody's interested in that land or when that land, um, when it makes sense to develop that land for affordable housing. Okay. Will? Uh, that, that's a great point that you bring up about the land banks and the development. The timeline on developing affordable housing and non-affordable housing, if you want to call it that, around that is key because we've seen a lot, and I'm sure you've seen this too, where you, you build this really nice neighborhood around that and a lot of infrastructure, and then you come in and want to build that affordable housing unit, and there's a lot of pushback from the community on not in my backyard, I don't want that here. And I, I think that there's been some discussion and some interesting ideas of doing the affordable housing first. And so you step out and you build the affordable housing, you build these beautiful complexes, these wonderful places for people to live, and then build the houses in the community around that. And so I, I think it might be more successful, might be a little bit more money up front, but it's successful to switch our thinking on that. Oh, very clever. That sounds like a good idea to me. Yes, That's Kelly. not my idea, but I, did, I do like the idea. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to revisit the uh, definition of area median income. Kristen, sure. Kristen mentioned that um, housing is considered... Well, affordable housing is needed by definition for households with area median income that is below 80% of whatever your region's area median income is. Um, so we have some misconceptions sometimes around who needs affordable housing. And when incomes are as high as they are and housing costs are as high as they are in Fort Collins and Loveland and soon Greeley, uh, we need, everybody needs affordable housing almost. So when you think about the professions that are impacted um, by these area median income levels, um, you've got almost all of your first or second year elementary school teachers. You've got almost all of your emergency services personnel, uh, office managers. Uh, it's, it's a lot of people who work in our community and, and that's not even getting into some of the lower wage possession um, professions that we know about, um, dining services, janitorial services. So we are getting to a place where the majority of our community is struggling um, because that 80% area median income, like Kristen said, um, is $85,000 for a family of four. Um, that's not bad income, but that household by definition would need something affordable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what other factors influence affordable housing? We have income, what other, oh, there's the chart. Somebody wants to look at that. It's hard to see from here. Right, and so if you look at the chart, somebody with a 30% of area median income making $17,900, that's maybe a preschool teacher. So I think you know when Will talks about things like the not in my backyard sort of idea, you know I think it's helpful to remind people that these are maybe your preschool teacher, your, they teach your children's, um, they teach your children, they, 
they're the people that wait on you at Target or at a restaurant. And so I think when we humanize that and make sure that people understand that these are you know, people that are already living in our community and that they, they, they need some relief from the housing right. costs. The other thing I want to emphasize, just so people know what we're talking about, is we're talking about people who are working. And that's important. There's a whole other category of dealing with people who are homeless. Yeah, I, I, homelessness is, is really a, a small, much smaller piece of the population, thankfully. Um, really, when you speak about housing in general, housing is the solution to homelessness. So uh, I think a lot of us try to keep that focus on the solution. Um, so. Okay, well, we well, do have housing oh. that, excuse me, sorry, um, but we do have housing that addresses people that maybe don't have any income or have social security disability or very minimal income because of um, mental health issues, because of health issues, b being disabled. And so we, 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 uh, we do have housing in the community that addresses that, Red Tail Ponds and, and the new uh, project on Mason Street, which will, will help. So, so we are talking about that. Um, like, like, like Will said, there's a wide swath of people that we're covering here with housing affordability. Right, right. You had a comment, I think, right. Will. And, and there's also the other element of people in need of housing, which is our senior population. And I, I think sometimes that gets forgotten, unfortunately, because we do focus a lot on the younger workers that are coming in and the families that are coming in and that have needs. And that's valid, but the seniors are in need as well. And having some affordable senior options, whether that's affordable housing or just options for seniors that are affordable, because mm -hmm. it seems like your housing gets much more expensive when you are a senior. There's a lot more care needed in the property. There's HOA fees. There's maintenance, all that that has to be absorbed somewhere. It becomes very expensive. And so we end up having a backlog. We have a lack of inventory because, frankly, those houses aren't being vacated. We have, we have homes where, where seniors have lived for 30, 40 years. They can't afford to move into something that's the right size, that's the right layout, that's what they need, we don't have it for them. And so they're staying in those homes and the people that should be typically moving up into that market have nowhere to buy. And so those folks can't buy those homes, so they're, they're driving until they can find find somewhere, somewhere to live. And yes. so we're, we're, we're creating a, 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 like a, a, a pressure cooker. Okay, and that assumes that seniors <laughs> want to leave their homes. Well, well, yes, but I have a lot of clients and family members and people that do want to. They want to get into something that works better for them that's newer, that's less maintenance, that takes care of what they need, uh -huh. but there's nowhere to go. And certainly yes. nowhere to go they can afford. So, and, and in Fort Collins in, in Fort particular. Collins. And so that's right. a real problem. I yes. would like to mention on that really important note, seniors obviously are at a point in their life where their income is fixed. Um, people with disabilities sometimes are in that same position. Neighbor to Neighbor operates housing for both of those populations and um, I think that's a really critical piece of the population. We also were approached by the Partnership for Age-Friendly Communities about a year ago, and their idea was a home share concept where you're utilizing the existing inventory better. And when a senior does wish to age in place, um, they can stay in their home. Uh, my staff serves as a matchmaking service to identify a renter and and we maximize those larger homes with a young family or a couple or an individual CSU student, whoever it is. So that's one way that we're trying to maximize inventory uh, when we seniors don't have a lot of options. Okay, I have a question for you, Kelly. Does Neighbor to Neighbor offer only house, uh, housing counseling or actual housing? So we run the whole gamut. We do housing counseling for eviction prevention for the county, mm -hmm. and we distribute a quarter of a million dollars in emergency rental assistance every year. So that's rental housing counseling. We also have a portfolio of affordable units. So uh -huh. 135 apartments, some are single family homes, but the majority are apartments uh, for families or individuals with lower income. And then we do a lot in the way of home ownership housing counseling. So about 1,200 households every year come through our classes or our home purchase advising to make sure they understand what they need to have in place before they start to think about buying a home. Okay, very good. Now, what other factors um, influence housing affordability? Things like wages or college debt? I mean, how, do, how does that factor in? 
All of the above. Yeah, it, it all does. Everything factors in. It's travel time. It's roads. It's your job. It's everything factors into housing affordability. And so that's why it's it's a community. It's a collective community issue that we all need to focus on and, and speak to and help in any way that we can. And so we can't, you know, the city can't solve it. We can't solve it. You know, there's no one group that can do that. But together, we can all pick off pieces of that and help address that issue. Okay, I want to throw a, a be the devil's advocate. What I have read is that I think the slide actually shows something like that up there. Uh, it shows how housing affordability, or yes, has changed over time. And I'm wondering if it's not a housing problem, but a wage problem. Because wages have stagnated. And what I've read is, in some cases, even gone down since the 1970s, if you uh, calculate uh, real time. And houses have gone up proportionately a huge amount. So I'm wondering um, if it's a wage problem and maybe a housing problem, but it's more a wage problem than a housing problem. And how do you deal with that? I, th I think the wages are definitely you know, something that impacts that, um, you know, wages have stagnated, like you said, and so they haven't kept up with housing, rising housing costs, that's for sure. I mean, I think student debt, um, people have um, high student debt, and so they're unable to borrow money because uh, their debt to income ratio is, is not right. Uh, so I think that that's something that plays, plays into uh, affordability issues. Um, there's, a, there's a really good article in the Denver Post that came out maybe a couple months ago, and it, it talked about some of the, the things that were influencing. Um, not enough inventory is a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. that, that is, that's definitely a factor for us and pretty much all the cities along the Front Range, I believe. Uh, it's not just one thing. There, there are a lot of things that are affecting, you know, the fact that housing is just getting um, out of range for many people. Um, and I think we have to look at all those issues. I mean, f for us at the city level, one of one of the things that was affecting, we felt might be affecting housing prices was the fact that there weren't a lot of condos online because of the, the construction defect laws. So the, the, what that had to deal with was that people could sue, could go into a condo situation and one person could bring up this big lawsuit. And so people were wary of buying condos and ins the insurance companies got out of the condo um, insurance kind of market, and so you, you saw no condos being built. And condo, for many people, for, for me, include, including me, uh, condos are, were a way into home ownership. So you mm -hmm. start out with a condo, and you built up equity, and, and then you were able to, to get into a single-family home, and, and many people don't have that option right now. So there, there are a multitude of things that are affecting um, you know, housing affordability, and I think we, you know, we try to chip away at all of those things. Okay, how much will, do you think, investors buying small houses drive up the cost and therefore take those houses out of the market that uh, people without huge incomes uh, could buy? I don't think that's as big of a factor as, as we want it to be. Um, obviously, if you're up against a cash buyer who's an investor and you have an FHA loan, you're not as attractive as a buyer to that seller as maybe the cash offer. But... I have seen where finance offers beat cash. So if there's if there's something in there, if there's a term that's better, if you have really good relationships among agents, um, if there's people that you trust on both sides of that, you can beat out a cash offer. And so that that does happen. That's an issue. Um, but speaking to what you were just just talking about, the the housing prices and the wages, wages are a huge problem, and we feel like our housing prices are getting out of control mainly because we're hitting some milestones on that, on that graph. We're hitting that 400,000, now we're hitting 500,000 as average. When you hit those milestones, housing sales dip a bit, everyone takes a deep breath, and then we move forward up to the next milestone. We're, our historic average, we're directly on track with our 40-year average of 5% appreciation year over year. So we're, we're right on track. It just feels a little dramatic at the moment because we're in the upswing, of a correction, and we're hitting some of those milestones. And Greeley's getting ready to hit some big milestones in the next year or two, and they're going to feel that too, and it's going to take a bit of a hit, 
because yeah, that's a shocking number when you hit 400,000 as the average, and then you hit 500,000 as the average. I mean, we laugh at Boulder, their average is about $1.1 million. And so we're all like, well, oh, thank God you don't live in Boulder. It's like, you know, because the average is a shocking number. But once you get past that, it meets up with your income, and everyone realizes that's, that's where we should be tracking. That's where the prices should be. Then we tend to get over that, market goes back up, people start buying again, we hit the next milestone, we take a deep breath. So we're just in that cycle, but we're not we're not out of hand. But how much have wages gone up? They not haven't 5%, gone up enough with it. Not five percent. They a haven't year. Met, <laughs> and that's a problem all across the board because they have not met that, and they need to. And we need to look at ways to make that happen. Um, it's it's not just wages, but that's a huge part of it. At right. the same time, I don't think it's realistic to expect wages to follow that level of trajectory. I don't know of any employer who pays seven. I, I heard the statistic that house prices have increased 7% per year over year. Would you say that's inflated, Will? Um, no, actually, we were actually, actually low. We were about 8 to 9% okay. last year, but our historic average, we're right on track with that five. Okay. Yeah. So, I should have brought some graphs. I'm sorry. So year over year, 7 to 8 plus percent increases, that's going to be impossible to keep up to with keep up with with wages. So I do not think that that should be our goal, that we're going to solve the housing problem with wages. Everyone deserves a living wage, and we need to have pay that is equitable. So I think especially that lower income staff, they're underpaid. Um, so it's a problem, but we aren't going to solve the housing problem that way. Okay. Now, uh, what about rentals? We haven't talked about that very much, and I guess that's one of the things that we do. We subsidize rentals, right? HUD subsidizes rentals the most. Uh -huh. um, and anyone who is in a subsidized unit generally has a requirement to pay 30% of their income toward their rent. So the idea that subsidized housing means everybody gets to live for free is not true. Uh, people on a national uh, basis n believe that it's a healthy income to expense ratio if you're spending 30% of your income on your mortgage or your rent, whatever your housing cost is. So we follow that with our subsidized units as well. Okay. What about building costs? I guess they've gone up exponentially as well. Uh, tremendously, yes. That's That's been a huge, huge problem. It starts with the land. I mean, you're, you're in, before you put a shovel in the ground to build a house, you're well over $200,000 before you start building the house in, in the city of Fort Collins. And um, we can discuss whether that's fair or right or what. We have fantastic services. I love the city of Fort Collins. I am all in. It's beautiful. People love it for a reason. So I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but the reality is it costs that much to start. And so, um, yeah, construction costs are, are very, very high. And then labor, getting labor from people to do the work, that is really, really hard. After we went through the, the little cycle we had, the, the, the Great Recession, and, and we were hit so hard, we were down 2% year over year, and it was just, <laughs> we were all in a panic when other places are 20, 30, 40% down year over year. Um, we had a lot of people leave the construction industry and they're not back. They went into other businesses and they're not here and they're not available to build the houses. We, we will sell the houses as fast as you can build them. And we are. We're, we're building less than half the number of new homes now than we were before the Great Recession. So it feels like there's construction everywhere, but there's just not enough. And Kristen, does the city do anything? A lot of people like to say that the city has... Um, permit charges are too much and all that kind of, uh, all those figures. What can you enlighten us with there? I, I think that the city is definitely looking at ways to um, not necessarily expedite the process of development, but at least make it cleaner and, and easier and flow smoother. Um, you know, how the, the fees you know, are what they are, they cover, you know, the costs. And, and we've always had a policy of development paying its own way and, and um, smart growth in our community. And I think that that's what the citizens of Fort Collins want. So, um, you know, there, there is so much that that is just market driven that really we don't have as much control over. It's a desirable place to live. A lot of people want to live here. And that, that's a good thing. We, we all want to live here as well. Um, so I don't think that the city uh, is charging excessive fees I think we're charging you know for the cost of develop development is paying its own way and and like I said that's been our policy and that you know will continue to be our policy I think at least with the current council and so 
Um, you know, I, I, I understand that, that there are expensive costs and tap fees are, you know, for water, bringing water to especially um, anybody outside city water is expensive. So there are, there are things that create, um, you know, make houses more expensive, but uh, I would say that the city is, is doing what the citizens want them to do. Okay, because one of the things that I was told is that the tap fees and the various fees are almost the same for a $100,000 house, like a Habitat for Humanity house, versus a $400,000 house and that all the fees end up costing almost as much. And so the implication was if the house is worth less, the, sh the fees should be less. We, we do waive some of the fees for affordable housing. Uh -huh. We have done that, especially you, there again, um, the 30% and under area median income, which is what we feel that the market won't, can't reach. And so there is, there is some there are fees, and we also use, you know, our federal dollars um, that we allocate to different, um, to housing catalysts and neighbor to neighbor um, for housing. So uh, the city does help with affordable housing. We don't build affordable housing, but we definitely help, and we definitely have waived fees for affordable housing projects. Okay, and Will, what does the real estate industry do, and who should take the lead in this? Um, well, just real quick to the, sure. to the fees. Go I'm ahead. sorry, that's a real hot topic in the real estate industry. Um, I, I'll just say I think they're too high, but I understand where they come from and I understand what they do. Um, I would hope that the city maybe could look at some ways instead of cutting it for affordable housing and giving incentives there, perhaps we can look at other ways to pay those fees. So perhaps it's over time. Maybe it's through a different property tax on that property. Maybe we can spread that out to help make that more affordable up front. I don't know. There, there's just some ideas that I think we need to look at because it is, I know they go to great services and it's based on the people that live there, that use the roads, that use the parks, that use, that's based on that, not the value of the house. But I think if we could look at other alternatives to get that money for the city and help people to get into those homes, that, that would be enormously helpful. So it, it's just, just an open mind on how to do it, that's all. Tristan? We do have a committee going that, that's that been formed right now because there was some uh, backlash, if you will, uh, about the fees that were being charged. And so I think that there are members of the real estate community that are involved in that and, and developers and, and citizens that are that are looking at the fees to, you know, we want to make sure that they're they're right. It's, it's not, you know, there's... We're, we're not wanting to overcharge people necessarily, but there are amenities and things that we like in the city and that we want everyone to have. And so, you know, I think the idea of lowering our standards is, is just something that's not acceptable to the city, but we, we are looking at the fees to make sure that they're, that they're right-sized, and, and I think the committee will come back to city council and we'll take a look at that. Okay. One thing I'd Kelly? like to note is that when we think about the solutions to this issue, I do feel that the city is in a very critical position to change some of the conservative policies. And I know that that is being looked at in the committee that Kristen just referenced. I attended that meeting this week, and I was encouraged. Uh, the city invited, I think, all of the developers who had any interest in housing affordability to come to a, a meeting. It, the room was packed. And the developers had the opportunity to share their ideas around what solutions would be and what their barriers are. Uh, I'm not a developer, so I won't try to share all of those ideas, but the city does have them. And they've also set at the city a very ambitious goal of providing 10% of all apartment inventory as affordable inventory by the year 2040. Um, right now, would you say it's around 5%? I think it's around 5 or 6%. I think it is around 5% now. And that is an issue because our poverty rate is 14%. So I was already a little frustrated uh, as the, the resident social worker um, by the 10% goal because it's not enough, but it is very hard to get to 10%. So we have to set some type of goal that has some level of being reasonable. Uh, what I was told at that meeting, which is a concern, is that in order to achieve that ambitious goal of 10%, like 20% of all of the permits, building permits that are issued from now, starting now until then, will need to be affordable. But yet we don't have any policy that's sufficient 
to drive 20% of building permits being an affordable product. Okay, and we have, I think, on the screen, the annual goal and the development in the pipeline and the units built since 2015. And so the, the goal, I guess, it goes up to 244 units per year starting in 2020. Do you have anything That's, to add? I, I don't. It's, it's ambitious, and yet I think it's something that we need to achieve to you know, make sure that there's equity in our community. So I think we're, um, we're you know, willing to work with our partners. We're willing to activate those land bank properties to, get, to make that happen and keep exploring new ways. I mean, uh, citizens of Fort Collins did, um, in the building on basics uh, tax that was passed in 2015, uh, there were $4 million allotted to affordable housing. And so, you know, we may need to look, uh, as other cities have, Boulder and Denver, at other, other ways to get more housing inventory, affordable housing inventory, uh, you know, going and, 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 and in incentivized. And so I'm certainly, a, as a council member, willing to look at other ways. You know, one thing that, uh, one interesting thing that I've learned about recently is sort of this community land trust where, the land is, is held and purchased um, by this trust, and then people are buying just the house, not the land that it's on. And when they go to sell, if they move, then they don't get the portion, you know, they only get the portion that they've paid into, which is the, the cost of the house, and the land and, and, and the land stays in this trust and makes it slightly more affordable to be a homeowner. I mean, there, so there, there are a lot of interesting concepts out there, and I, th I think we should start exploring different ways. Um, because that goes to the issue of housing affordability, where you know, a lot of times we're talking about rentals when we're talking about people with, with a lower income, but there are people that, uh, that want to be homeowners, and they also can't afford to be homeowners. And uh, the, a community land trust may be a way to get those people into home ownership. So, and when we were looking at those rental uh, those units, two hundred and forty four, I think per year, we are saying that those are mostly rental units. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, again, because of something I read in the newspaper about Denver, Denver had quite a few rental. Uh, um, affordable housing units, not units, homes that had deed restrictions and they were not enforced. I'm wondering if whatever units we have do have those restri restrictions and they are enforced. Yes and yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, because that sounded really pretty awful. <laughs> Yes, oh, Will. Oh, and speaking to, to the rents and, and, and where that's going, that, that's a bit of a concern because we do have a lot of apartments that got built recently in the last few years. And they're very fancy and they're beautiful and they're huge. They have lots of wonderful amenities and they're very expensive. And those are primed to be converted to condos and sold. That's what they're designed to do. And so they're, they're laid out that way. They're built for it. They might keep them, but they're going to sell them. And so in real estate, we're looking at that thinking there's going to be a flood of condos coming. And that's going to flood the condo market, and it's going to take all those rental units off the market, which is going to push the rate through the roof. And if you think it's high now, it's going to go up a lot. And so we're, we're very concerned about that. And that's to do with the construction defects law. They, they, they built those apartments, and they're holding them through the time period, the seven years until that expires, and they can't be sued. And so they're holding those and likely going to convert them. And so we need to be in front of that, watching that, especially for those rents, because we can be planning those units now, but we need to be planning more units to make up for the ones we're getting ready to lose. You mean as, as condos? We'll lose them as apartments, and then they'll be condos. Right, and they're not affordable now. They're, they're very expensive, but those renters are going to go somewhere, and so they're going to go to those other units that are currently kind of affordable. Well, those landlords can raise those rents, make more money, and people are going to move into those, those places. We're going to lose some of the more affordable units. Well, I was told at the state housing conference last October that a healthy housing market would have around 20% of the product as condos, and that our status is below 5% since this construction defects issue. So would you still feel that we are going to be oversaturated with condos, or is it actually going to balance itself? It's hard to say. It depends on which ones decide to convert. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to note when construction defect came up earlier, uh, Barbara, you had a question around home ownership and, and is it still as important to upcoming generations? I would say that 
millennials are more flexible, but many millennials still want home ownership. They want it differently. They might not want the three car garage and the big suburbia experience. Uh, so a condo is a wonderful opportunity for them to get into the, the market, but not at $400,000, which is where we're seeing a lot of the condos are so expensive. So I just wanted to make that note from earlier. Okay, very good. Um, one thing I was wondering, and I don't know who, who knows the answer to this, are developers allowed to use innovative uh, and very efficient technology, or is that something the city uh, really dominates by their building codes. I mean, I think I've read about some kinds of interesting innovations, and I don't know if we can do that here. Uh, we do have building codes, and, and, and they would have to build to, to the codes that we've adopted. So uh, so I'm not sure what kind of innovations. Um, Different like materials, materials, for example. Oh, okay. Maybe less expensive materials, that kind of thing, I mean, as I, long as they prove their value. I mean, they do what they're supposed to do. I think as long as they would fit with the building code, they would something like that would be acceptable, I would think. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of people talk about tiny homes, and, and there's not necessarily any restriction on tiny homes. They're, I think tiny homes wouldn't be as affordable as people think they would be because some of our, especially some of the water costs in some of the different parts of town might, might make a tiny home almost as expensive as a, a regular size home. So um, but I think innovation would be welcomed for sure. I think that you know if there if there are ways to to build houses that are up to standard and up to code that would be use innovative materials, I I, I think the city would welcome that. And I think we need to look at innovative land use as well. So I know we have land use codes and there's there's plans for how we should use things, but those were based on our ideas years and years ago. And I think we should be open to looking at new ways to use the land we have and to react to what we're experiencing now and, what, and to plan for what we're getting ready to be hit with. And, you know, auxiliary dwelling units, I love them. Somebody wants to do something with their garage in the backyard, fantastic. Let it be a rental. Give somebody a nice place to live. It's already there. Why would it matter? And so those are some of the frustrations, like let, let people be there. Um, density is huge. I mean, we need to focus on density and we need to plan for it. And there are certain places in Fort Collins where increased density makes sense and it's just simply not allowed. And so the city is looking at that. And I know they're open to those discussions, but I, I fully support that because that is the only way we're going to address this. In other words, up and not out. Up and closer. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. More like a big city. I'm wondering well, if there are any that. questions in our audience. Anybody have any questions? There's one. They're pointing at each other. <laughs> Mary Dietrich, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm curious. We moved here in 1979, and we've seen the boundaries of Fort Collins grow, but not as much as it possibly could. And uh, we just recently built a new home within the city limits and found that the number of lots available were very limited. So I'm curious how much land really is available within the current city limits for development of any kind of housing? Or are we pretty pretty saturated? Um, there, there's some space available uh, in the northeast part of town, and I think that that's the biggest sort of greenfield or undeveloped space. A lot of the space that we're looking at right now is infill space. So um, as Will was saying, you know, we're looking at density and, and going up versus out, and. And that provides its own challenges. I mean, there, there are a lot of challenges with infill development. Um, many people who've been in the community a long time don't necessarily like the idea of becoming a big city. They, they like the way Fort Collins <laughs> is the way it is. And so uh, there are some challenges. And, and, and I think that we are, we are definitely looking at density and we're definitely looking at taller stories and, uh, you know, especially along transit lines, the MAX line in particular. And... I think that I think it will come to pass, but I think that there's there's a lot of conversations that we'll need to have in the community to to get people used to that idea and really, uh, you know, as we see more infill, we at city council see more pe more projects coming in front of us that are being 
um, you know, disputed because people don't necessarily like them, whether they're a business that is near that or they're a, they're a single family home and all of a sudden they have, you know, a two or three or four story building that's closer to them than they, than they expected. And so uh, I think that there are a lot of challenges with tr trying to get people used to the idea of, of, of going up. But, but yeah, there isn't a lot of land. Now, now there are, there are areas that uh, will likely be annexed into the city, including along the Mulberry Corridor. Oh, yes. And so there, there is some room for expansion there as well, um, but, but not as much space as we once had. And so I think that we start looking at housing in a different way, single family, maybe not as much single family, more townhomes, more condos, um, apartment. And that, that, that's what, I think that that's what our future looks like. Yeah, okay. and I appreciate that the city is looking at that and looking at it wisely because there are places where density makes sense. Building skyscrapers in Old Town Square doesn't make any sense. You know, we of course would not do that. But Harmony Corridor, why not? I mean, why wouldn't you build up on Harmony Corridor? You know, so put, put it where it makes sense. And, and like you say, along the transit lines, of course, that, that makes sense. So, you know, being smart about it is, is what we need to do. And so when we say density, higher everyone automatically thinks, I don't want that behind my house. It's like, well, we're not asking for that behind your house. We just want it somewhere in the city. <laughs> Please let us do it somewhere. Yes, well, the other thing is, how do you deal with the traffic on Harmony? <laughs> that would be the city. No, I'm yes. just <laughs> you know, Well, the, you're and advocating it. I want to know how you're going to deal I, with I it. I absolutely agree. Sure, and I think transportation is a big conversation. And when you're talking about housing, I think you can't talk about housing without talking about transportation. And so I think you need more multimodal transportation. And I do think that, you know, for people who, you know, there's this drive till you qualify kind of idea that, I mean, if it, we're starting to look at these issues in a regional way and really... Mm -hmm. You know, I I have a coworker um, in my day job that were that lives in Wellington, and so we are looking at bus service between Wellington and Fort Collins now. And and so I think that you know I think we will start to ha have those conversations regionally. But I do think that public transportation plays a big role in in where we build and how we build. Yeah, and I'll tell you what we're doing right now is making traffic worse by pushing people out who work in the city but live outside is making it worse. And so if you can get people to live in the city and work in the city and pay their taxes in the city and pay for the roads in the city, it's going to get better. And so we're, we're looking at that saying, I don't want them in the city. I want people out. And then they're driving into the city and we don't like the traffic. Well, that's why you have traffic. And so if we can look at different ways to use that property to have developments that allow you to live and work and recreate in walking distance. I love that about where I live. I can walk over to Bendel Coffee and grab a coffee. I don't have to drive to Starbucks. So it's fantastic to be able to do that. And I think more people want to, particularly millennials, they want that badly. And so if you give them that, that's where they'll go. And one of the things I think it's important to remember about new development, while few people are excited about it, unless it's housing, which we desperately need, um, a lot of times the developers are required to improve the infrastructure in their yes. area, including the, the roads and the traffic issues. So no one in Fort Collins likes driving through the Vine and LeMay <laughs> intersection. It's like you're going to go and hopefully you don't get hit by a left turn. Um, so, But the, de the developers who are developing all of the student housing up there are going to have to pay to fix that. They're going to, to work with the city, which it's tens of millions of dollars, to fix that interchange. So do we want student housing everywhere? No. But do we want that intersection fixed? Yes. So um, it's a balance. Well, and that, that goes to development paying its way. So, you know, so that our roads aren't more congested or that we have some relief from that congestion. I mean, that's, that's why some of the fees are high, so that we're, you know, people that live here currently aren't frustrated by that new development that comes in or bogged down with traffic or have to deal with, you know, the problems at Vine and LeMay. Okay, and so your implication is that the developers of the student housing on LeMay near Lincoln, I think it is, are paying into an oversized development fee or some kind of fund for that? They will eventually um, once a solution is found and enough developers are, are 
in that region to develop all of that land. What I was just told by a developer this week is there's a reason that Northeast Fort Collins has not been developed yet. There's an interest in putting affordable housing in the most expensive area in Fort Collins to develop. There's no infrastructure, there aren't adequate roads. Um, it's going to be expensive to, to develop that. So um, just a lot of considerations going, going into any land that's left at this point. Uh huh. Okay. It's important well. to remember the developers are a business, and so they have to make money. They have employees to pay. They have people they have to pay. They have to pay expenses. So they have to make money on that. It's not just a free pot of hey, they're a rich developer, and we'll just take all their money. It's like that's not how it works. So we have to really strike that balance. And and yes, they need to pay their way. Absolutely, I agree with that. But we also need to make it possible for them to pay their way and not have extremely expensive lots, like we just discussed. Uh, and, and expensive homes, because that's all you're going to get if we keep keep raising those those fees and, and the cost for them to build that. If all of the expenses continue going up and there's no relief, then, then of course housing is going to get more and more expensive. There's not going to be any relief in that. So it's just something to keep in mind that that, that actually is a business. And I've, I've heard pushback on, well, the developers are not going to raise the price of housing just because we increase the cost of them to do business. Why would they pass that on? It's like, well, because they're in business. You know, that's, that's how it works. Right. Well, your your comment about balance is the important one, of course, because uh, so many people use that LeMay and Vine intersection and putting a huge number of dwelling units in that section of land will put in a tremendous amount of traffic there and it only gets worse. It doesn't get better. Yeah. I don't know if there'll be any kind of transit out there or not, but I think those are basically student houses, right? Student housing. Yeah, I would have rather seen them be denser in the city than out there. I would have rather seen a high rise somewhere closer to CSU or wherever they're going to be rather than having this really pretty place out there where they all have to drive. And there's a lot of people having to drive from there. So. Or take public transit or somehow. Public transit, yeah. Yes, Kristen. I believe they have a shuttle. Uh, oh, that okay. was part of their plan. And and so all developers, when they're developing a piece of property, they have to do a traffic study. And so if if the traffic study indicates that this, the roads as they are can't handle the kind of uh, traffic that will be coming out of these apartment dwellings, then they have to provide the money for the fixes. And that's how, you know, so okay. that, that that's always a piece of the development process. Okay. Any questions from the audience? There's one. Hi, my, my name is Beth DeHaven. I just wondered, um, hearing that 200,000 number just really stuck in my head. Um, could you break that down a little bit? I mean, what is that 200,000 and how can we possibly expect to have affordable houses if you're starting at a base of 200,000 and working up from there? I guess to me that is an essential piece of this whole puzzle. It's the cost of the land first, the raw land to buy it, and then fees to well, to, to participate in paying for the roads and the infrastructure that you have to do. There, there's cost to develop that, to build that community. There's a certain requirement, which I tend to agree with, but the city, I've always loved that, that they require a certain amount of green space in every community. I agree with that. I think it's great, but that has to be paid for. And so that, that just raises the price. And then you have the impact fees. You're looking thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for, for taps to get water and sewer to the house. I mean, that, that's, that's where it just, it just ticks up. And so, yeah, you're, you're at about 200000 before you put the shovel in the ground. And that's holding fees. I mean, you have developers that have to pay for this. They have to pay interest on their loans. So there's, there's a lot of business side of that as well. But yeah, it, it's right at $200,000 before you start building. And it doesn't vary from the price No, that, that's really where you start. I mean, obviously, if it's a larger lot, you're going to have a little bit bigger expenses or, or whatever. But but yeah, that, that's pretty straight across the board. I, I knew a developer that was trying to build homes in North Fort Collins, and he he was like racking his brain trying to get them under 300000 He said, how am I going to get these under $300,000? I can't. I just simply can't. And he wanted to, but there was no way to get them there because it's so expensive just to start. And then you add on rising costs of of labor, rising costs of materials. I mean, that that's outside of our control, but it's real. And so you have to have to face all of those. So yeah, it's it's become a bit of an issue that we, we need to find a way to get in front of it. Well, one of the things I was told that is that a developer has to get the construction loan before they start building. 
and that the interest rates are higher on construction loans. And it, and it all is up front before they're getting paid anything. Is that correct? Right. That's the side that we don't get to see. That's not the pretty house and the nice green belt and all of that. That's the, the business side of just getting the work done to get where you can do the job is, is trying to finance it. And so, yeah, that, that's an enormous part of it. And it all comes down to money. If you can solve the money problem, then you can deal with all the rest. And so it, it's all about the cost. Well, we didn't touch on that, of course, but in, in Denver, I think they now have a, a tax um, or a, an employee fee, whatever you want, employer's fee, where employers are putting money into the city for housing. Yeah. And Boulder has something similar, not as broad-based as, uh, as the Denver one, but is that something that anybody's talking about here? I don't know if they're talking about it here, but I do sit on a legislative board with our state association of realtors, and we, we look at bills that are going before the House, and we, we advocate for or against or whatever. But um, there was one where there was a requirement. They were making it a requirement to put in electric charging stations in all homes that you build. It's a great idea. I happen to have a car that's partially electric. I think it's cool. I think they should offer that. I don't think it should be a requirement. We pushed back on the requirement side. Make it an incentive. Incentivize the builders and developers to do it well, to do it right, and to help make it better for the client and the customer. That's where you win, by making incentives rather than requirements. And so it's just a mind shift on instead of requiring all of this of people, let's incentivize them to do it better. Okay, very good. Well, I think it's getting near the end, and I would like to give you enough time to tell us what do you see as the most promising solution for helping to solve the affordable housing problem in Fort Collins in northern Colorado. Who shall we start with? Why don't we start with Will? We'll just go down the line. <laughs> just exactly what we're doing today, having this conversation and being open about the problems and our potential solutions and listening to other ideas, hearing from the community, hearing from city, all the different groups, that's exactly how we're going to address it. One, one group moving forward saying this is my idea and this is who to blame and this is what we're going to do isn't going to work. But doing this, this, this is how we're going to fix it. Okay, great. Kristen. Sure. I think, um, you know, I think that that's right. I think more than having just conversations, you know, the partnerships that the city's trying to build with nonprofits, um, that, that's how, because the city doesn't build affordable housing, but we uh, partner with other agencies to build uh, housing and we'll continue to do that. I think uh, I think something some innovative ideas like you know I don't know the will of Fort Collins for ha for having another tax but that certainly in, could be an option um, to look at a tax that would um, help with affordable housing. I think ideas like the community um, the community land trust you know to have uh, which would open opportunities for people to um, get into home ownership. I think that that's a really great idea. I know that CSU is looking at building um, oh, yes. how, workforce housing, and I think that that's a really interesting concept. I mean, a lot of uh, ski towns are, do that. And so, you know, I think as workers, uh, you know, whether it's the hospital or big employers in town, find it harder to uh, attract uh, workers, at, you know, especially at lower wages, I think that that becomes a reality, and I think that it'll be interesting to see what CSU does. I, I think they're definitely seriously looking at, at housing, potentially um, on one of the properties they own. It looks like Timberline might be, might be a good property, and that would be a great place because there's already uh, bus lines that go out there. And so uh, I, I think we do have to look innovatively. You know, I, I think uh, it's a really difficult topic, and, and as you're... Uh, as you said, why is it so complicated? I wish it weren't as complicated as it is, but uh, you know, I think I think it's not going to be just the city to fix it. I, I really do think that it's in partnership with different groups, and it's it's looking at things like fees, and it's looking at um, what other what other communities are doing, what are best practices around this, and um, but I think it's going to take all the heads together to to come to a place. But I mean, the, many cities across the United States are, and as you said, across the world are struggling with this. And I don't, we don't have all the answers right now. But Great, thank we'll keep you. Keep working on it. Okay, Kelly. I think first and foremost, we need to keep in the forefront of our minds the equity component. Because while people in the middle class struggle with this discussion, I'm in this discussion on a very regular basis. People who don't have 
um, access to be a part of this conversation because their single parents and working two jobs are struggling. And they're coming in my office all day long, not being able to make ends meet. Um, studies show that when housing is not stable, everything else in your life goes poorly quickly. Um, housing is one of those things that's been around a long, long time in the world, so we have a lot of data around it. What it shows is that when housing, when there's a breakdown in housing, everything falls apart. You don't get your kids to school on time, you don't get to work on time, your relationships fail. So it really needs to be a priority because it is the foundation for success, it's proven. In addition to keeping our, our mindfulness around the equity issue, I think we do need to continue to listen to the we need to continue to listen to the experts, um, the developers. Um, there's an interest uh, around wanting the nonprofits to start developing. I don't want to develop. I'm not a developer, um, but I do want the, de the developers who are coming to the table who are really interested in providing an affordable product to do what they do well, um, and I will continue to, to provide the services that we do with housing counseling and things like that. So I think that's, that's probably one of our biggest potentials is that we do have developers at the table who are wanting to provide um, equity. So if we can listen to what they're saying and get the ball rolling, um, one of the only um, quasi-governmental nonprofit type entities in town that does develop is our housing authority. It's called Housing Catalyst, and we are very fortunate to have them um, because they're doing a bang-up job. Uh, so really glad to have Housing Catalyst in our midst. Um, Habitat is terrific, and that's a single-family home model, so um, it's a little bit smaller reach. So if we could really start to, to move the needle, um, one of the um, Solutions that gets kicked around is inclusionary housing. People love it or they hate it. Um, that is the idea that you have a certain percent of each new development that is set aside for affordable housing. I tend to like that because it follows the population. You could have 10% of your development um, being offset with some level of affordability. Now the developer wouldn't have to necessarily take the hit on that. Some people are concerned because then they would increase the rents on the other 90% of the units. Not necessarily, maybe there's an incentive that they could get from the city. So thinking outside the box, um, I'm excited and excited and thankful for this opportunity to talk more about it. Good, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate all your expertise because it, it, it is confusing for many people, and the more we talk about it, I guess the more we learn. So thank you to our panelists and to our studio and viewing audiences. If you'd like to see this and other Cross Currents programs, uh, they are available at the League of Women Voters website and at Fort Collins TV channels 14 and 881, as well as on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in.